All right, this is the last half of chapter three on the cell. And so we've learned about the parts of the cell and now we're kind of gonna talk about the physiology of the cell, how the cell does certain things. So one thing we've talked about how the cell membrane is selectively permeable or semi-permeable, meaning that it allows something to move, some things to move across it while others cannot. In fact, most things cannot move the, through the cell membrane because you have to be small and not um, polar to, to go through. And quite honestly, that's not a lot of things. But some stuff does go through, and they go through using passive transport. This is um, when you hear passive, there is no required energy. And remember that energy molecule we learned about is ATP. So we don't need the mitochondria for these processes that we're going to talk about, which include diffusion osmosis, facilitated diffusion, and filtration. So diffusion is the movement of molecules, atoms, ions, from where there's more of them, a higher concentration, to a region or area where there's less of them at a lower concentration. And this is because, as you hopefully know, things in fluid are in constant motion and they're colliding and bumping into each other. And so, um, as these molecules move, they, by themselves, without energy, just spread out and spread apart towards areas where there's less of them. So remember that this can only happen with substances that are able to cross the cell membrane, that the cell membrane is permeable to. So it has to be small stuff, and it can't have a charge on it or be polar. So oxygen, CO2, and little bitty fats are what we can move by diffusion. Um, you probably have heard of a diffuser or even have one in your home or office where molecules move from a concentrated area to a less concentrated area by themselves. You don't have to um, wave them around. That will help speed it up, but by themselves they can diffuse. And same thing, another example they use um, is a sugar cube dissolving in water. The sugar moves from where there's a lot of sugar towards areas of less sugar until um, it's the same throughout the whole fluid. It's, uh, it's homogenous. So solids and water can do this across the cell membrane that's permeable to them until they reach what's called equilibrium, where there's the same amount all over the place. And that's where you would have um, equal amounts in both compartments. So here is a picture of the sugar cube. So things, high concentration and things by themselves are gonna move to lower concentration. And it's here that we have reached equilibrium. There is no net movement of these molecules because they're just continuing to move for sure, but um, they're moving back and forth. These are no, not moving towards the sugar cube, they're moving away. But once you're here, you move, these sugar molecules are moving all over the place because you're reached equilibrium. So let's put a membrane that's permeable or semi-permeable um, in this beaker. And so what you see is on this side, there is a high concentration of the solute. And this solute happens to be able to cross the membrane. Maybe it's small enough and doesn't have a charge. Maybe this is oxygen. And then we have the water molecules. And we can see there's more water on the side that doesn't have all the sugar, or uh, sorry, oxygen, whatever molecule the solid is. And so what's gonna happen is these red molecules are gonna move from where there's more to where there's less, while these blue molecules are gonna move from where there's more of them to where there's less. Now, that movement of A across the membrane to B is called diffusion, but because B is representing water, the movement of water from B to A is called osmosis. And so they will move in opposite directions. Osmosis is always the opposite of diffusion until we have reached equilibrium and we have the same amount of water and the same amount of solute on both sides. Where does this actually happen in the body is when we breathe in oxygen and the oxygen is traveling in our blood and it's trying to go to a cell that needs you remember the mitochondria needs oxygen and releases CO2 to make ATP. So 
the oxygen will diffuse from where there's more oxygen in the blood towards the cell with the mitochondria and the mitochondria is releasing CO2. So there's a lot of CO2 in the cell and it goes from high concentration to low. So these are diffusing against each other, but they're both going from high to low of that amount. So high to low oxygen, high to low CO2 just happens to be in opposite directions. Both of these are passive transport, do not require ATP, and we call this diffusion. Now facilitated diffusion, the word facilitate means to help. I'm, I'm facilitating learning, I hope. I'm helping you learn anatomy. And so facilitated diffusion is helping diffusion across the cell membrane. And this is gonna be for those things that can't go across the membrane. They're either too large or they have some charge. And so they were talking about ions that are positive or negative. Remember cations or anions or it could be large molecules like sugars, amino acids, things like that. And so they can't just go across the membrane by themselves. By diffusion, they need help. And so they're going to use what's called usually a protein channel to get across the membrane. And again, they're moving from where there's more concentration to less. So usually we draw this as a gradient. A gradient just means a hill. And so we're going from high concentration. This is concentration right here concentration down here so we're going over uh, sorry just kidding let's try that again concentration is actually what we're measuring here concentration and this is actually time so if we were graphing this the oxygen we just saw in the picture is going from where there's more ox oxygen over time to areas where there's less until you reach equilibrium now as long as you're moving from high concentration to low, it is a passive process, which means there is no ATP required. So here you see a region of higher concentration of these large molecules. Notice they are too big to move across the membrane. And so they're gonna use a protein embedded in the membrane, a transmembrane protein, that allows this molecule, specific for this molecule, to be transported into uh, from the outside of the cell into the cell. Um, where We're going from high concentration to low, so passive transport. Now this ion is able to go through a channel um, maybe this is a, a, a chloride channel, and so this chloride cannot usually just pass on through. I'm not sure why they're showing that because it's going to have a charge. Usually it's going to use a channel protein. So these are how we transport molecules from high concentration to low that are not permeable to the membrane. Now I mentioned osmosis earlier. Osmosis is the diffusion of water. So we're still moving water, but we're moving water from where there's more water to where there's less. And if you have a high concentrated substance or side, that by saying that, like you think of a really high concentrated tea, there's less water in the tea. So water always moves opposite of diffusion. Um, it's still moving from where there's more water to where there's less, um, but it usually does this through channels because water is polar, so it has these partial charges. Remember, hydrogen positive and oxygen negative. So it can't just go through the membrane very easy. It goes through channels, protein channels, called aquaporins. Aqua meaning water and porin meaning a hull. And so again, since we're moving from where there's more water to where there's less, we're still going down that concentration gradient um, no ATP is required. And so here you can see the water molecules. Um, gosh, those are too close together. But um, the, the larger purple substances are some type of protein, and what we have is more water over here. The protein is impermeable to the membrane, so we're not going to have diffusion of the protein. You would think, right? These want to cross the membrane, but they're too big, so they're going to stay over here. But water can go across until these are the same concentration. And you look at that. That osmotic pressure allows the water to, to actually defy gravity and, and, and move to this side. So I do want to make a note here. Um, water moves towards 
the area with high concentration, solute concentration. So you might write salt sucks or some sugar sucks. If you have something with a lot of salt or a lot of sugar, it's gonna suck the water towards that area. That's gonna cause diffusion. You might have been evil at some point and done this to a poor little slug. You put a lot of sugar or salt on the outside of the slug and water will diffuse from inside the slug towards those areas of high concentration of solute and it looks like the slug's melting. So osmotic pressure is the ability of osmosis to generate pressure to lift a volume of water like we just saw in our beaker. And so osmotic pressure increases as the concentration of those solutes increase in a solution and water is going to move toward that area. And so that brings us to a term called tonicity. And the, the uh oh, sorry, tonic means concentration. So underline that word, that means concentration, tonic. So iso means same, so this literally means the same concentration solution. Hypertonic is high concentration solution. And hypotonic is low concentration solution. And this is how you can compare different solutions um, with each other. So two solutions that have the same concentration are called isotonic. And they will, uh, they're at equilibrium right here. So there's not going to be any net difference in water. In hypertonic solutions, you have high osmotic pressure. And so what's going to happen is you have a high concentration. And if you put a cell in a hypertonic solution, the water will go from in the cell like a slug to where there's more, a high concentration. If you put that same slug or cell in a hypotonic solution, that means there's less solutes in it. Um, water is actually going to move the opposite way. It's going to the, the slug would gain water if you put it in pure water. Um, let's not talk about slugs, let's talk about red blood cells for a second. And this is tested a couple times, so make sure you understand this. And if you have a question, reach out to your peers or to me, um, or both actually, to see if you can understand this, because this isn't the easiest thing to, to get. So here's a red blood cell. If you hit, put it in hypotonic solution, so hypotonic solution would mean pure water. And so what's going to happen is water is going to move from where there's more water to where there's less because inside this red blood cell there's solutes, oxygen, there's a little bit of CO2, there's proteins. So water is going to move from where there's more water into the cell where there's less. And what's going to happen to the cell? Well, it's going to swell up and could eventually burst or lice. Remember, lice means to break. So it could puff up and burst. This is why if you've ever had surgery and you got an IV of a solution, they did not give you distilled water. They didn't give you pure water or your cells would absorb those water. You would swell up and burst. Not good. What they do give you is an isotonic solution, a solution that has the same concentration as your um, body fluids. And so that saline solution has a little bit of salt in it because your body has a little bit of solids in it too. And so what happens is because the solution has the same concentration as inside the cell, water might move out of the cell, but at the same time water's moving in. And so this cell is at equilibrium with its environment. And so isotonic solution does not affect the shape of the cell, where a hypotonic solution is going to make it swell up and burst. And the opposite of all of hypotonic would be hypertonic. So this might be like sugar water. If your IV was too concentrated, you would lose water, you would dehydrate your cells, and they would shrivel up. Um, and they call that crenation. Um, don't need to necessarily know that word. But water is moving from where there was more water inside the blood cell now towards this syrup, this sugar water, or this very salty water. And this is why you cannot drink salt water because it's going to pull water out of your cells. You're going to dehydrate and die. So that was all osmosis. So we've got diffusion, which is the movement of small non-charged molecules from high concentration to low. We've got facilitated diffusion, which is the movement of from high to low of larger uh, molecules through a protein channel or transporter. We've got osmosis, the movement of water from where there's more water to where there's less. 
and now we have filtration, which is a process that forces molecules through membranes due to pressure. That's the big deal there. It's still considered passive process um, and we only really see this when your heart beats and it sends this pressure of blood um, into the capillaries and what happens is that pushes water and smaller solutes um, out of the capillary bed and that's called filtration. Of course the larger molecules aren't able to be pushed out and so they stay in the blood and so this is what we're talking about high high blood pressure pushes these molecules out of the capillary into the uh, interstitial fluids. So passive transport requires no ATP, no energy. Well, active transport requires ATP. Think about being active. It's going to take some energy, and our energy molecules ATP, remember, provided by the mitochondria. And so we have active transport, endocytosis, exocytosis, and transcytosis. Endocytosis and exocytosis are both types of bulk movement. Um, bulk, B-U-L-K. So I think of when I'm buying bulk items, I usually go to um, Costco or um, Sam's Club. And so it's going to take a lot of energy to get very large amounts of things into and out of the cell. We'll look at them in just a second. So active transport is now moving substances across a membrane, but instead of going from high concentration to low, we're going from low to high. So if we're looking at our concentration gradient, we're now going from low to high concentration. So if you're on a bicycle and going up this hill, you're going to have to put in some energy. And so uh, I don't, I didn't mean to just circle the TP, <laughs> but you're going to have to pedal to move up. And so that's why it is active transport. We're moving things from where there's already less of them to more, the opposite of diffusion. And so what we're going to use to do that are pumps and think about um, like a air pump or a water pump it requires some work you've got to either plug it in or do the manual labor to move this stuff um, from where there's more to where there's sorry from where there's less to where there's more and we do this with sugar amino acids and some ions the most common one and the one that will be on your test is the sodium potassium pump um, we are not going to worry about secondary active transport but it is where we use sodium to diffuse and it brings along stuff with it. It doesn't require energy, so I wish they wouldn't have put it here under active transport. That's a little bit um, confusing. So here is the sodium potassium pump. Um, sometimes they call it the sodium potassium ATP PACE pump. We just call it the NAK pump, okay? So write that in little a, that's the sodium and the K, the potassium pump. And so what the sodium potassium pumps is sodium potassium. Now it does need ATP to do this because we're gonna move sodium from levels uh, or areas where the levels of sodium are already low and push them to where there's already a bunch of sodium and, and same thing for the potassium. So let's look at this. The sodium potassium pump always pumps sodium out. So think of uh, the word, if you want somebody to get out, you might yell no or nah. And so that's how you can remember the sodium pumps out. And so it pumps actually three sodiums out at a time. So you can look at this transporter, or this protein pump. This is an integral protein in the membrane of the phospholipid bilayer. And it takes three sodiums at a time. And when it gets those three sodiums with ATP, it changes shape. And that allows the three sodium to be released out of the cell, three at a time. Nah, sodium, out. And now that we've had the shape change, two potassium can enter the protein and it goes back to its original shape and pumps the two sodium in. Now if you look closely, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, there's already 18 sodium in and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 out. So we're pumping two of those six into where there's already 18. We're going from low concentration to high so it requires energy. So we are pumping potassium and you might tell somebody like hey can we get in no that's pumping out or okay 
you can let them in. So OK tells them to come in, and it's two at a time. And that will be important in our last unit on the nervous system. So same thing for sodium. We pumped three sodium out where there was already more sodium. We're going against the concentration um, gradient. So this is that secondary active transport X that. Endocytosis is the movement of substances into the cell. Endo means inside, site means cell. So those are words you, you word parts you do want to learn. We use these a lot. So endo inside this word root right here, site means cell. So we're going to move substances in to the cell and it's going to create a vesicle. Remember that vesicle can store be stuff or, or transport stuff inside the cell. And, and remember I said this is bulk. This is for really large substances or mass amounts of substances. And there's three types of endocytosis. Pino means to drink. If you like pina colada. All right. All right, so that's the liquid stuff. Fago or fago is the solid stuff. So fago actually means to eat. So uh, osis, a process of a cell drinking. A process of a cell eating. And then you have receptor-mediated endocytosis. And this is where the membrane engulfs a specific substance um, because a receptor said there's, hey, we need this and there's some in the area. Let's go ahead and grab that and, and bring it in. And so let's look at pino and phagocytosis. So here's some liquid outside of the membrane and there's some particles, of course, um, in this liquid. Um, and so if it's taken in a liquid and forms a little vesicle that holds that fluid, that was penocytosis. If it brought in a particle that was solid, it's called phagocytosis. Now what's going to happen to um, this vesicle, this what we might call a food ves vacuole? Um, we can use a lysosome. Remember what lice means? To break down. So we can, let's say this was like a bacterium that was deadly to the body and one of your white blood cells ate it. It might add a lysosome to it and that breaks it down and then it can just get rid of the waste. This is exocytosis where we're taking the waste or the digested products or something we don't need. Now that could be a bunch of protein we made in milk secretion. Remember that? So exocytosis is where this vesicle kind of binds with the membrane and releases things out. Now in receptor-mediated uh, endocytosis, we're looking for specific things only. And so when those molecules um, bind with receptors, that lets the cell know that these are in the area. And so they can go ahead and engulf them in and take those specific items in. So this is bulk transport of material called endocytosis. We saw exocytosis, exocytosis, exo, exit, site, cell, a condition. So a condition of cells getting rid of things. The vesicle that contains those particles fused with the cell membrane actually releases the contents. And so this happens with our secretion of milk products. This is also happening in nerve cells when they release neurotransmitters to communicate with your muscles to move. Um, we'll see this in our muscle unit. Transcytosis is not a very common one, but we should mention it here. Um, it is, does involve receptor-mediated endocytosis, but it's immediately followed by exocytosis. And trans means across. And so the purpose of this is to move something from one end of the cell across it to the other. And we see this happen actually in HIV. And so um, what happens is the... Oh, this is exocytosis. So... We've made some product, we put it in a vesicle. Remember, we're gonna take it to the Golgi because the Golgi is where you do UPS um, shipping. So we're gonna ship this out of the cell. So take it to the Golgi, it repackages that vesicle. It starts moving towards the membrane, it fuses and releases its contents. Maybe it's protein from um, when making milk. Now, transcytosis, here's the HIV and the HIV infected um, uh, helper T cells. And so what happens is that actually do some endocytosis of the virus and cross it across whether it be the anal um, epithelial cells or the vaginal ones. Okay, in our last bit 
Um, we're going to focus on the cell cycle. And so this is how cells, uh, a process cells undergo to make more of them. It's also called cell division. And there are stages of the cell cycle. The major ones are interphase, mitosis, and cytokinesis. Now interphase, they called it interphase, inter means between, and so they, under the microscope, the scientists really couldn't see a whole lot happening here. So they said, oh, this is interphase, the phase between mitosis and cytokinesis where we can see stuff happening. But after further um, studying and researching, they found that this is actually where the cell grows and makes copies of DNA and copies of organelles in preparation for division. Now mitosis is division of just the nucleus. So a cell can do just mitosis and stop there, and what will it be? It will be a cell with not one nucleus, but two nuclei. And so that could be a problem like cancer or whatnot. Normally, cytokinesis will follow mitosis where the division of the cytoplasm, and remember cytoplasm, all the fluid and the organelles will get divided up and now you have not one cell but two at this point. And they'll go back into interphase. And so it looks kind of like this where here, this long period of time is interphase. You're gonna do a, a short lab on this, but um, it starts with G1, S, and G2. And G, I would start this slide. This gives you a lot of information that you could use. So interphase is G1, S, and G2. In G1, the cell grows. In S, um, it stands for DNA synthesis. So it's where the, the DNA gets replicated in the, in the nucleus. And then in G2, it gets ready to divide. So it's divvying up um, organelles and making sure it has copies of everything. And then it goes into this phase of mitosis. Remember what we're dividing in mitosis? It's division of the what? Mitosis is division of the nucleus. And there's four subphases in mitosis. There's prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase. It spells PMAT. And so this is the molecules, um, the spindle fibers moving our chromosomes um, to separate them. And after you've finished mitosis, what do you have? You have two nuclei. Now usually cytokinesis then begins during telophase and it ends shortly after. It's a pretty quick process and that divides the rest of the cell. So where we started with one cell, we now have two. So interphase is a very active period uh, in the cell cycle contrary to what they believed at the beginning and it's where the cell grows and actually in G1 um, some cells will stay there and just maintain their normal function um, until they need to divide then they'll replicate their DNA and prepare for um, dividing the nucleus um, and the rest of the cell. This interphase is also where like I mentioned we make more everything else to prepare for division. We already learned that in our cell cycle picture that S phase, which stands for synthesis, is where we're making DNA, we're replicating DNA in that phase. And then G1 and G2 are for gap, and this is where the cell grows and where the cell prepares to divide. Now, what I don't like about these notes is these are not in order. That's why I would like you to refer to the picture where it so showed G1 comes first, S, and then G2 of interphase. And then we go to mitosis. So some soma, if you remember, centrosome meant uh, central body. So some means body. So somatic cells are your body cells, and they divide from one cell and make two through the process of mitosis and cytokinesis. To do cell division, you have to do both of those parts. Mitosis, divide the nucleus first. It's really important because it has the chromosomes in it, and then divide everything else through cytokinesis. The phases of mitosis are prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase. Remember, it spells PMAT in that order. And during prophase, it's pro means the first, so it's the first phase, kind of like pre. And this is where we take the um, nuclear envelope away and disperse it. And the chromatin that I told you um, is invisible and uncoiled DNA, they actually start coiling and become chromosomes. And this is the first place where your first phase, you're going to actually see chromosomes under the microscope. Meta means middle, so this is where the chromosomes line up in the middle of the, the cell called the equator. 
Anna means back, so these are where the chromosomes separate from one each other and back away from one each other, each other um, going towards the poles. And then telophase is the end where they've reached, telo means end. Um, so telophase or telophase is the chromosomes have reached opposite ends and we're going to return the nucleus, um, we're going to undo everything we did in prophase. So the chromatin, chromatin and condensed to chromosomes in prophase, but in prophase, the chromosomes return back to chromatin. Um, we got rid of the nuclear envelope and the nucleolus, and now we bring those back. And so here are the major events of mitosis and what happens in a table. But this is a great picture of it. So here we're in interphase, you can't really see much going on, but in prophase you finally see chromosomes. And notice the nuclear membranes going away. In metaphase, this is actually like late prophase, sometimes they call it prometaphase. The chromosomes using the spindle fibers made by the centrioles are migrating towards the middle, and once you reach the middle, you're at metaphase. Now those spindle fibers are having a tug of war on these chromosomes and splits them in half, and that's the phase called anaphase, where they're backing away from each other. And then in telophase, they've reached opposite ends, and we start returning the, the nuclear membrane and the nucleoli. And while that's happening, the second process of cell division occurs, cytokinesis. And so cytokinesis forms this cleavage furrow where you pinch the cell into two, and now you don't have one cell, you have two. And they're both back in interphase, G1. So cytokinesis is the cytoplasmic division, and it can begin in anaphase and continues through telophase making that cleavage furrow where it pinches the cytoplasm in half and forms two new cells. And here's an actual picture of a cell um, dividing. So we are not for anatomy learning control of the cell division. So um, please X this slide, but I do want you to know a little bit about tumors. And tumors develop because of the lack of control of the cell division. So all this taught you is how to stop cells from um, getting out of control. But if they do get out of control, they divide too quickly and you have a tumor, um, which is just an uncontrolled growth. Now benign tumors are going to stay in the same area. They're, what's called encapsulated. They can get bigger, but um, once you remove them, no worries. Now, benign tumors can become malignant over long periods of time, and malignant tumors are what you think of when you think of cancer, and they are invasive. They can metastasize, which means they can go from one place to the other. For example, from the breast to the brain. Um, so if it's in your brain um, they and you, you pass away from that, which you, usually once it goes to the brain, um, it's very difficult to survive, they'll say you died from breast cancer because they're naming the cancer based on where it originated. Um, so this is, you, you form these tumors due to mutations and genes that help keep cancer at bay, and those are called oncogenes and tumor suppressor genes. And these genes in your DNA, like these, are tumor suppressor. They stop tumors from um, happening, and so they slow down mitosis. But if you have a mutation or you take a chemical in, like a drug, that inactivates or removes that gene, you can't regulate mitosis, and then you'll, you'll get cancer from that. Uh, oncogenes um, are also genes that can control the cell cycle um, and, and onco means cancer. So these are like cancer genes that help keep um, cell division controlled. And so here is a picture of um, cancer cells. And so you see this tumor and then here's some like normal cells. And so, um, once you lose cell, cell cycle control, um, the cell starts to divide and it can differ, de differentiate, so it's not doing what it should have. It won't have inhibition. So, in other words, inhibition is when cells touch other cells, they stop dividing. Well, these cells don't have that. So, they just, even though they're touching other cells, they're going to continue making this 
this tumor and if they invade they can metastasize and so you can kind of see that this oncogene is turned off or the tumor suppressor genes turned off oftentimes it's both of these are messed up and then um, once you've lost control the cells just starts to divide out of control even though it's touching other cells it's making this tumor and if it gets in lymph or or capillaries it can metastasize and move to all areas of the body <clears throat> So we said that cells can differentiate, which means they specialize. And so stem cells, you've probably heard of them. They're found um, in umbilical cords or early um, after uh, fertilization, you have a stem cell. And a stem cell is a cell that can divide to form new stem cells. They, they self-renew themselves and they can just keep dividing, keep dividing, and they can even make what's called progenitor cells. Um, Stem cells are like a blank page. They can become any type of cell and create many, many other blank pages that can become other cells. So what is a progenitor cell? Um, a progenitor cell comes from a stem cell, but it is partially specialized. And, and so it is somewhat committed to what type of cell it's going to be. And so it can't, you know, the whole world isn't its, its canvas. Um, it can only paint like trees or whatever. Totipotent cells um, are cells that come from stem cells that can be any type of cell. And so, like I mentioned, a fertilized egg, um, cells of the early embryo, if you take those apart, they can become any type of cell. In fact, that's one way um, identical twins are made is in early embryo development, the two, the, the big ball of cells kind of splits off and those totipotent cells just keep dividing and become a whole nother human. And it's the same DNA because it came from the same original cell. So you have some identical twin action going on. Now pluripotent is limited number of cell types. And so these are the progenitor cells. And so you can see like stem cells can make other stem cells or stem cells can make progenitor cells. Um, we see this in, in when we make blood. Um, and then that progenitor cell can become specialized type of cells. And they differentiate, right? Um, so this is showing a progenitor cell can become skin cells or epithelial, which is a type of epithelial cell or, or sebaceous gland, or it could become a neuron or astrocyte like um, this one would be a, a totipotent cell right here. It can be any kind of cell. So um, this is just fun to know, not going to test on it, so you're welcome to read about stem cells and regenerative uh, medicine. But what you do need to know is this term apoptosis. This is programmed cell death, and while this sounds bad, you do need some of your cells to divide. For example, between your fingers, if those cells hadn't divided, you'd had web fingers and web toes. Now, are some people born with that? Yes, because their cells failed to um, kill themselves. So sometimes this is called cell suicide. Uh, you also want this to happen if the cell has an infection and your white blood cell tells it to kill itself. It will program itself to die. Now necrosis is cell death from some type of damage. This is not a normal process. Um, this might be to a uh, major infection or burning or something. Uh, lack of oxygen. Um, you have necrosis. And so um, this is showing a sunburn and necrosis of those cells due to damage. And that is all of chapter three. You will have a couple labs and a practice to test what you remember. Remember that you can do your practice more than once to get a higher grade also for extra practice so that you really, really understand the material. And some of those questions are from a bank. So you might not get the same ones over again, which gives you more um, exposure to possible test questions.